His mercy. His unconditional love and the grace. Amen. So, we all have a music tonight and the, that time is gone. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, it's great to be here. It's great to be alive. Let us invite the Lord's presence at this time. Shall we pray, O oh, Father, O oh, faithful, merciful God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, ever-living, merciful God. We thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you for taking out, us out and in for board and um, our workplaces or those who don't work or stay at work at home. Wherever we know, everywhere there are dangers and so you have protected us. You are the reason for us here today, and we thank you. We pray a blessing upon each head. Brother Greg, Brother Lloyd, and their respective families, and my queen, and all the members here that have not been able to make it up to this time. We don't know who will tune in. Oh, we pray for them the same way. Bless thou and teach us what we ought to learn in this session. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so before I put my screen up, we want to have a little open session, open forum. Any question? Uh, I don't know if you want to hit the reason for this season. I I won't tell you. I have all of that covered because <coughs> you see, the the Bible is careful. God is careful to lay out every nitty gritty, as we would say of these things and that's why when we talk about the present world of Daniel chapter um, of Revelation chapter 13 the beast that we talked about last week uh, it behoves us to look at the beast in a comprehensive manner God wants us to see everything that the beast is saying and so the worship of the pagans, the worship that was um, married into the Christianity when it came on the stage, and married into uh, Israelites, because what has happened in the past is that those nations that, that captured God's people and have interwoven their philosophies, their um, beliefs, their religion, their idolism. They have interwoven it with God's people. And so this is where in the Bible God is showing us that. And so the seven heads is showing us all the churches, all, all the religions that you may think about. That's what it comes to. They exist because they were born during the Dark Ages out of the Reformation period. And so when, Mar when Martin Luther brought forth his message and then uh, he was the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, so, you know, that made a movement. But what happened? Another message was introduced. Baptism by immersion. But those 
who were adamant in the, in the Lutheran church said, no, they will not accept this other revelation. So they stayed where they are. And as a result, those who accepted moved on from that church. And so you have now a Lutheran church. Then those with the Baptist, you have a Baptist church. Those with uh, uh, grace, you have Presbyterian. And so all of them come up. And so when God sends his message, meet in due season. But the people in one religion never want to move. And so in the Christian uh, dispensation, we have the division. Now read for me um, Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter tw um, 7 and verse, uh, verse 24. <coughs> Daniel chapter 7 verse 24. See what it says. Yes. Uh, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Amen. That's, That's it. So, the, so you see the Bible, the prophecy here is giving us a symbols of horns. This kingdom in Daniel chapter 7 is Rome. No doubt about it. It was talking about the beast that is called the nondescript beast. That is the last beast in Daniel chapter 7. That means we have gone through Babylon, we have gone through Middle Persia, we have gone through Greece, we have gone through the four kingdoms of Greece, and so we have come to Rome. Rome here is the origin of the horns, but it says that the ten horns in this kingdom, it is prophesying of ten kings. The reason why they never had horns here is because they were just prophesying of the king. But what do we see in Revelation in our time? We see the kings. We see the, the, the horns crowned. <laughs> we see. So God is so careful to guide us through the line of history and prophecy and show us that this originated this time and it existed at this point in time. The ten horns of all the kingdoms. Originally the king of kings of Europe, but eventually what happened through wars and conquests, nations were divided, the earth becomes splintered. So there are a multiplicity of nations that the Lord is showing us and he's showing us a multiplicity of churches that exist in our time not just Rome we can't look at Rome in, in, in the part, part when it rained and come into the point where the, 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 the modern nations are reigning and still focus on war. We lose our way doing that. And I can't apologize to say that because the Bible says that clearly. The Bible says we are living on the, the, ten, the um, ten kings, universal rulers in their own territory. But God has a plan. He's going to show us how we are going to get out of it because the ten kings only exist in the New Testament period. 
in our period. And so we will have to see how the commingling, what, well, what influence do the nations, especially the leading nations, the nations who accept Christianity and are called Protestant or Christianized nations, how do they relate to God's church? God's people because they have to coexist and we are the church so we must know that and it is plainly show, showed in the word of God so all we can do is just thank God for the prophecy the prophecy are the eyes of the church and the eyes give light to the body. What that we study in Matthew chapter 6, you will see that the, the eyes are, are the light to the body. The prophecy is, is the light to our spiritual bodies. So, yeah, so uh, I'm going to just throw it out there at that point and hear your question and hear your contribution. Again we have the topic of the uh, the reason for this season. Anybody believes that Christ is the reason for this season? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Great. Tell us. What you know? Tell us a Christmas story there. Christ is the gift of the God's gift of the gospel. In him he is the indescribable gift. He being God the Son himself chose to come to earth to rescue a fallen humanity and pay the price of sin, which penalty is death. And having paid that price, he made a way for those of us who accepted that, 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 that as a fact of life, that his blood was shed for us. He made a way for us to be reconciled back to his Father. And so we can now be called the children of God. And so Christmas is the incarnation of Jesus Christ coming to earth. And of course, it is commercialized by pagans as a time of joy and merrymaking for material reasons. But in truth and in fact, the reason for the season is to accept the incarnation of Christ becoming fully man and preparing himself to die for us because that was the only reason that he came away from giving us an overview of his kingdom but his primary purpose was to die to pay the price for sin the wages of sin is death the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Yes. I never, go ahead. Any question for Greg or any <coughs> comment? <coughs> I just think Greg hit it on the nose, the reason for the season is this. Christ coming and sacrificing his life for, for us. Yep. Oh. Um, yes, well said. He is the reason for the season. And um, I'd just like to add that the bill. The bill had been paid in 
அந்த breaking up or something has cool a breaking up so we are like we are able to reflect him so we are like like little mini jesus is reflecting yeah. light in a dark world you know and that is restoration and it should be the most thrilling thing Oh, so, <coughs> you, so we you, can reflect the image. You hear me? Hold on. You, are you hearing me? Huh? Yeah, we hear you. You're doing, yeah, some, hearing. you're doing something with your phone that your voice going out and coming in. Anybody getting that oh. effect? Feedback? No, no, no. I, I, heard, I heard sister clearly. I heard her clearly. Nothing dropping yeah. off? Yeah, you're clearly. Okay. No, nothing, nothing. Okay. Okay, well, maybe it's my phone. Yeah, sometimes I'm moving around a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe, because my, my thing here is just going in and out. Anyway, go on, since you're hearing it, all right. Yeah, so it's like mission accomplished. <laughs> I came, I saw, I can. <laughs> and it's done. See it, and you're done. Uh -huh. So that's my little take. Perfect, perfect. So in general, Christ is all and in all. But as we're on the topic of this celebration, I know Greg, you touched on the celebration, as you say, because you said that the pagan, paganized, paganized Christ. Um, well, suppose I say Christ never told us to celebrate him in that, in this time when Okay, it seems like it's my phone because I see it a while ago. Jump off. <clears throat> yes, suppose I would ask you, I would say to you, Christ never told us to celebrate him at this point, you know, for this day, December 25th. Um, even though he, we know he was born, but history showed us that other people were born and they use Christ to sort of wrap their birthday and so by celebrating Christ you are celebrating them but you just call it Christ, Christ's birthday. How would you uh, relate to that? The celebration that is. Did you hear me? Yeah, prior, prior to you coming on, Linden, your beloved wife says that uh, for her, Christmas is every day. And uh, I interpreted that to mean that we celebrate with Christ daily. We celebrate not only his birth, we celebrate his life, celebrate his death, we celebrate his resurrection. We do. And we are now patiently waiting for his great return. So every day is Christmas, for true. Now in regards to the other people that you make reference to, I am. Uh, I don't see any evidence of that in my Bible, of their significance. So, for all intents and purposes, you know, I don't regard them scripturally. They're not a part of my Christmas in any way. Okay. 
So what is the difference with next week and today? What is the difference yeah, with the in terms of what? The 25th and today. The 25th is is the, is the is the next is next week. Uh, today what, is today. And uh, what's the difference with the celebration? Celebration. Uh, we not. Are we celebrating today, commercially or spiritually? No. no. But we will celebrate next week, Sunday, spiritually and commercially. Correct. Oh, uh, why is that? That's because the pagans have have made. Froze. Froze a little. So we we, we we know that he was born, but as you said, he was born, but it not necessarily the twenty fifth of December. So the the, the the fact that it that it has been coined on yeah. the twenty fifth of December as Christmas, and they with tongue in cheek they say it is. The birthday of Christ, but you know it is it is overshadowed, overshadowed by commercialism. You know, oh, okay. we have this we have this myth of of Santa Claus. Who is Santa Claus? <laughs> He's coming down a chimney. Yes. Yeah. And I'm out riding a sleigh with reindeers and all of that. Ah, uh, you know, it 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 has no relevance for me. Ah, uh, okay. Uh. Yeah. Well, I'm with you, dear. I'm with you. But that's not, I don't know about you, but the culture that I grew up in, it has relevance for the children. As children, we, we, we were led or taught to believe that wholeheartedly. You think that was a good thing or a bad thing? And anybody can answer. I'm not trying to uh, pin Greg to anything. As we all grow up, in America they have different uh, images like the Frost Baby, Frosty, and the Frosty the Snowman. We never know about that. Uh, they have a lot of things different from us. But what we know is that the house better be shine. And that Gungu and Saril better be ready. And and that whitewash uh, that whitewash uh, mix good. It was we was uh, <coughs> brush it on the tree root and it run. It have to be white the stones around the house and around the gardens have to be white. And you have to do extra work to prepare for Christmas morning and Christmas dinner and open tie and Christmas tree. Well, no, we never have Christmas tree, but toy and gifts and special bread. Special bread were, were made at that time. The alligator bread, special music and after Christmas dinner, I have to go on the street and, oh, you know, like my district, everybody is on the district well dressed. Okay. And of course, those have Christmas Sunday, you have a brand new boot and it's burning you, but you have to step to church just to see. That's when you kill the fatted calf, so to speak, right? Ah, that's <laughs> kill the fatted calf. Or a goat. <laughs> yes. yes. So that's 
the tradition that we grow up in. And yes. the, the children are taught about who give them toy. Santa Condon Chimi. I remember being in Ulteria uh, in, in Christmas time and on the Christmas Eve you we see so much cars, people everywhere, this movement, people shopping here, shopping there, is just on and off. Um, and then um, Christmas Day itself is like what where is everybody here? <laughs> you know. That's right. Um, don't see hardly see people on the street in the, in the morning like that. So it was different for me. <laughs> and some people who, for the whole year, if they go, go to church Christmas, Sunday, right. they have to go to church. Right. Yes. But have you seen, uh, well, Considering or comparing at that time to now, do you think people are more are drawing away from the festivity or they are coming more into the festivity? What do you think? Well, it's, it's about, about the same. About the same, you know. Christmas is just, you know, family and friends get together for food and drinks. Yes. You know, uh, in America here, it is preceded by Thanksgiving. You know, to which again, as a grateful believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, for me, every day is Thanksgiving. I give thanks daily. So yeah, so it, it's up to the level, it's about the same. You know, we still see the malls filled, or it depends on where you go. If you got Jamaica, you still jump, you know, and you or Grand Market to buy Cracker Ball and Clappers and Thunderbolt and, <laughs> Thunderbolt. and all that type of thing there. As you said, the music is there now, you know, they're making all kinds of music referencing Christmas and using, you know, the birth of Christ to tie it all together. But my father-in-law, Lord bless, may his soul rest in peace, always say, Christmas is for the merchants in Jamaica. Okay. Yeah. They go to the bank after Christmas with their bags over their shoulders. Well, now, of course, we do it electronically. They press buttons and uh, yeah. their balances in their accounts go up. Whereas ours, come January, go down. We're broke. Oh, yes been out all of your money and now the creditors or the debtors are come to collect. <laughs> yeah. That's reasonable. That's well said. The poor people are broke. Are poor. The poor are poor and the rich are richer in these holidays. Amen, amen. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it's a good thing. So, you think, well, you don't think people are withdrawn from it more than about the same. What about kids knowing the fallacy about it, or knowing more that there's a lot of things about it that's not real? You think that the more intelligent to are is Christmas now that they yeah. really know I that think, Santa is not Santa. Well, right, right. I, I don't think that is the pop, as popular as it used to be. No, okay. The Santa Claus, you don't, you know. Kids today know that they're, they're for the most part, that their father, mother are really Santa Claus who went put gifts under the tree. Okay. They, they don't believe this, this white man with a big bag big belly, uh, red suit, or come down a chimney. Eating sugar. <laughs> eating cookies. <laughs> yeah. He very yeah. good cookie for Santa. Yes. Yes, well, you know, 
as long as we can keep our focus on the fact that Christ is to be worshipped daily and we can't make any fanfare or use Christ to wrap it and fool the people. So as long as we are conscious of that, then we are on the right path. Because God wanted to do that. Uh, all right, so any more question, lingering comment? All right, well, I think I have my stuff open and I'm gonna, if I can find my Zoom, I can share for a moment. Is that it? Everybody good? Let's go to the world. <coughs> so, we dealt with a portion of this subject. God would want us to know everything on the political and the religious side of our world. We need to get that and understand that. He doesn't want us to be obsessed with any one power. Because if we do that, we'll be in incapable of really following the light that is shining on our path. That's why he gives us the prophecies. Um, <clears throat> There are many, many references that I can read regarding to why we should study the book of Daniel and study the book of Revelation and study them in conjunction with one another, with the Bible. But suffice it to say, oh, I'm going to tell you I've read some before, but I'm going to remind you that God has instructed us and it has advised us to study these things, study them. All right, so it is not by chance that we are here. It is by divine design. It is. We don't just cross one another's path with the Word of God, just so, all right? Um, I think, uh, okay, I think I'm sharing, so. <coughs> Let me see if I can get going. All right, you know we have dealt with the first part, what I've done, I've <clears throat> put it in sections. So since the last time, I didn't have enough sections. So now I have put it in seven sections, this lesson. And so we would have covered, let me tell you how many we would have covered already. Okay, Let's see which one is this? It's number two. We would have covered two sections already. And so I'm going to be looking at how 
the wound was inflicted, this right here, coming up to it. What caused the wound? What caused the wound on the head of the beast? Uh, I'm obliged to read this chapter again so that we can refresh ourselves. And so what I will do is allow us to read, everybody to read a portion uh, right quick uh, and we'll see how far we can get. Read a portion if you find Revelation chapter 13. We are going to read 1 to 10 so you can read two verses each or three verses. Read two verses each and then I'll take the rest. Go ahead. First person, everybody will take it in a round. Revelation chapter 13, 1 to 10. Who will go first? All right, uh, three verses each. So. Yes. All right. Then I stood on the sands of the sea and saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head blasphemy. That's what's name. Now the beast which I saw was like a like a shepherd. His feet was like a feet of a bear, and his mouth was the, was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his head as it was as it had been mortally wounded, and his its deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. All right, you say he was like a what? Hmm? What was the beast like? What did you read it was like? It was like a, sh a leopard. Oh, uh, cool. right. Was like a leopard, his feet was like the feet of a bear. Okay. A uh, what else? In the mouth of a lion. <clears throat> All right, great. Uh, let me put up one here that you can see that screen close up. Here we, this we are looking at. All right, let's take a good look at this beast. Because we read about it the last time. But I want us to study it now. This is the beast John is talking about. It has a mouth of a lion. What else it has? The feet of a bear. The body of what? The body of, the body of a lion. Look at what you read. You read about, you described the beast a while ago, sir. Read it. What the body looks like. Snow is like a leopard. Leopard, like yes. He, the body has, he has a body of a leopard. That's what gives this beast its name, the leopard like beast. And some will refer to it as the sea beast, but you know when they say the sea beast of Revelation 13, it's talking about the leopard like beast. You must remember that this is what they talk. And the Bible describes this is a production of what the Bible says. And so there's nothing missing, nothing missing, nothing added, nothing taken away. Uh, you read also that it has, be, did you read about the horns? Yeah, it had ten horns. All right, it has ten horns. So well, what I was discussing when I think Brother Greg read Daniel 7 verse 24, 
This is a prophecy with ten horns. You notice what Daniel 7.24 said, that these are ten horns. These symbolize ten kings which shall arise out of the kingdom. So they are not kingdom yet. Shall mean future. So they were prophesying about these ten kings because these ten crowned horns, you see the crown on them? The horns with the crowns are representing the leaders of the present world. That's why they have the crowns and this is when. After the fall of this beast, after the wound was, the, the head was wounded, you see Daniel, even though he talks about the, the wound, he didn't show the wound. He talks about the, the horn head, meaning a combination of horn and head that root up, rooted up three horns. So here you will be left with seven, right? Seven horns. But, if, but again, it tells us that the ten horns sh shall be ten kings out of the kingdom. So that can, no matter what happened, no matter what adjustment is made to the ten horns, when the three were rooted up and it became seven horns and a combination of horned, that doesn't change anything. The prophecy was made already concerning the ten horns to shall be ten. Ten kings. So we are looking forward for the fulfillment of that. And here we have it in our time, starting, um, of course, during this time, because this beast is an outgrowth of the pagan, pagan and papal Rome, the papacy. However, this head is telling us something. This head that speak and see. It has eyes and it has mouth that speak against the Most High and change the laws or think to change times and laws and all that. This is the religious part of the beast of Rome, the church part. But the horn that is with it, that's what gives it the civil power. So here you are seeing a combination of horn, head, represent, represent what? Church, state. Church, head, religion, head, government, horn. Right? Religion, head, government, horn. Or church, and state, church and state. So when you come over here and you see heads and horns, what do you have? That's a question. What do you have on this beast? Did you read about the head? No? All right, let's read. Let's read. Let's everybody, let everybody read and then uh, we talk about it some more. Uh, mind you, I'm going to ask some questions because I want to see if, if you're grasping what I'm saying or if you have questions. So, you read three verses, three more verses. Go ahead. Somebody else? So starting at verse 4. Yes. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beasts, and they worshipped the beasts, saying, Who is like the beasts? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. 
and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. As up to verse 7. Next. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Oh. So, <clears throat> the Bible is talking about two beasts in one here because this beast has a, started out with this beast from this beast. So, it must show what it is showing, it must show the papacy. As a, as a wounded head on this piece. So I think what, so we finish, right? So 10? Yeah, I think we went to 10. Okay. okay. 3, 6, 9. One more verse. 6, 9. La, last verse was read. Verse 10 says what? All the world. That leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Yes, yes. Verse 10. Yes, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So, what folks have done, <coughs> they have it misinterpreted those words and yes we know that this beast reigned for 1260 days what is prophetic days to cover that time so the prophetic days become prophetic years so it's 1260 years of, of clear uh, brutality against God's people. But it received a deadly wound. And that's what we are, what caused the deadly wound on the head of the beast. What caused the deadly wound? I showed you that Daniel stops here. There's a cutoff point for Daniel when he highlighted this. But Revelation is showing us this. But he's showing us that this, the papacy, the downfall of the papacy, He's showing us that, but he's showing us more than the papacy. Alright? So don't let anybody tell you that this is the papacy. The only thing on this beast that represents the papacy is the wounded head. Alright, we say that over and over. And I don't know if you have any question and comment on that, but if you do write it down because I'm going to go through the sections now and then I will pause so just to be clear I hope you do understand that I'm talking about this piece but yes we are going to mention things about the papacy because it does have um, acts of the papacy within it. 
All right. So, this is the power. And if I may get back to where I said I would start today, and that is uh, conjunction with the wound. What caused the wound? From your recollection, what caused the wound to the papacy? Um, I think that's when the that's when the, uh, the Pope went into captivity, uh, from what I remember. Okay. But what caused him to go into captivity? What caused him to go into captivity? Yeah. Um, a good question. Um, <laughs> All right, so that's what we're going to talk about. So, again, take notes if you if you uh, need to remember some of these things because you're going to need them. So take notes, and so you, you can. Have these notes to go for by us for yourself. All right, so um, section three, I think. I'll start with some notes. Yes, I've had it some notes just to be sure that we with a clear understanding of the present world. So I'm going to go through them as fast as I can. So take notes. And at the end of the notes, I will <coughs> see if you have any clarification. <coughs> that means if you didn't hear something clear or you want me to repeat something, but we're not going to discuss this right, right now. So take notes. Note. It's an in historic, historical fact that it was Great Britain that controlled a big chunk of the world, including the Middle East, Palestine, we just talked about Jordan, known as Moab and Ammon. Ammon. Those were the descendants of Lot, now Moab and Ammon, Transjordan, that is east of the Dead Sea, modern day Jordan. Great Britain controlled the Arabs, again Ammon and Moab. And let me just tell you that Ammon and Moab are the two sons, or were the two sons of the two daughters of Lot. When they escaped Sodom and Gomorrah, they were afraid they wouldn't have children, so because all the men were burnt by brimstone and fire, so they caused their father to be drunk and have an incestual relationship with him. And so two of them gave a, a baby each, a boy, and from that, the nation of um, Moab and Ammon was developed. These are Arabs in Transjordan, right east of the Dead Sea, modern day Jordan. So, when you hear about that, you know, background. All right, Great Britain controlled in the Arabs, Africa controlled the Arabs, um, and those are Ammon and Moab, Africa, India. Caribbean and elsewhere. That's Great Britain. <coughs> Brothers and sisters. Palestine. Example, the Turks controlled from 1516 to 1919, at which time the British took control of it. And as the saying goes, the sun did not set on the British Empire. So history bears this out. Since 16, 
69 to the end of World War I, the British Empire grew, while the Mohammedan or the Turks Empire, also called the Ottoman Empire, went down. These are some notes from another study that hopefully we'll get to because this involves a world war that is imminent. So, notes continue. The expansion of the West. Remember, we are focusing on the West. This is what the Bible is showing us right here in Revelation 30. The main point about it is that just near the close of the Dark Ages, what do we refer to as the Dark Ages? That's a rhetorical question. The Dark Ages is what we just finished talking about, we have been talking about, and that's the reign of the papacy. The ecclesiastical Rome or papal Rome. So the Dark Ages, at the close down of it, at the fall of the papacy, that is, it is telling us that um, <clears throat> the British Empire grew rapidly and spread Protestantism and the English language and the Western culture and values everywhere. So these are captivating influences. These are power to hold together the world. This is a means of power that the Bible is showing us. All right, spreading through Christian influence worldwide, the British. So, so although it is the Protestant nations that broke the church state union between the Christianity and the pagans during the Dark Ages. But it was England who took the lead and through conquest was able to spread the Western culture throughout the world. During the 18th and 19th centuries, Great Britain sent out the most missionaries, the most what? The most missionaries throughout the world. That is why English is the international language. And good or bad, Western culture, politics, economic styles, fashions are most sought after in the world. The Western culture is most sought after in the world. I'm telling you that. That's facts. All right, so section three of this study, we now, that's the end of my notes. Next time I will have some notes for you for the United States of America. So, <clears throat> so now we come to this portion of our study and I'm going to go through it again as fast as I can. Please take notes so that you can um, <coughs> remember things. But what caused the wound? The question. It is commonly taught that the wounding of the head was caused by the arrest of Pope Pius VI of 1798. Now, we do agree that the Pope's arrest in 1798 was what? The climax of the wounding process. But it was, as we will see, it could not have been the initial infliction of the wound. Uh, why? Well, let's consider this. Let's illustrate. And <clears throat> you can illustrate in your head, but I'm going to illustrate on you thus far. Uh, if you pick up a, a slowly, I mean by driving to uh, somewhere, to another state, to Florida, to New York, you pick up a, a nail, you pick up a piece of metal, anything, 